I was wondering what your sweet spots are or your themes that you love to invest in. So we only invest in consumer. So anything okay. that is you know, B2B is not really for us. So in the context of consumer, three areas, health and wellness, education, and consumer internet. And then within those, there are obviously deep theses that we have about what's happening in each one of those sectors. Yes. Um, you know, everything from what's happening in e-commerce to marketplaces to consumer finance, you know, in the case of education, doing a lot in the online space where technology seems to be taking out this notion that you'd have to physically be there to be educated. Yes. You know, lots of content that could be repurposed. And then in health and wellness, you know, we just have a deep belief that you know, people's consumers' own responsibility for their health mm -hmm. is becoming not just awareness because of fitness, but healthcare, healthcare records, how doctors interact with consumers, those kinds of things. So more empowerment issues then. Empowerment yeah. issues and yeah. lifestyle Fabulous. issues. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, and could you tell me, do you invest in many women entrepreneurs or women founders? We'd like to. Um, <laughs> I'd say that we we do invest in situations where we've been able to find women. Um, you know, I think that one of the big issues is there, you know, I, I meet and see a disproportionate number of men yes. compared to women. Um, you know, a current investment we made was a women, were two women that met on the soccer field uh, thinking about what they were going to do after they had their kids. And they formed a company that is a um, direct, you know, marketing company for handbags that they design, sort of a, you know, multi-level marketing um, uh, business and uh -huh. you know it's off to the races doing well you know founded by women in a lifestyle issue for women and most of the stylists that they actually have hired are women right. so and their customers are women so yes. what we have found is that where we can find businesses where there's um, you know the whole basis of funding consumer based companies mm. is really about finding places where consumers have an emotional connection to some a brand Yep. And we have found that many of our successful companies, the consumers, are women. So right. it's just an interesting thing that we haven't been able to find more and more women uh, that we can fund. But certainly, at least even for me personally, kind of a personal mission, uh, you know, I'm an ex-operator. Right. So my deep experience before becoming an investor was actually being the person that ran businesses and started up businesses. Fabulous. And so, you know, I have obviously a predisposed... Um, uh, you know, piece of me that would like to, to help foster that and mentor that and find it. And I'm sure you add great value to those companies that you do invest in uh, apart from the investment. Well, I think that, uh, you know, here, here's what I say. There's nothing, there's, I don't think there's any analytical data that suggests that people that were operators versus people that were are more just investors do better than others. Oh, okay. I think what you probably could say as a you know, probably a reasonable assumption yes. is that most likely around the boardroom, people that are operators, you know, might be able to zone in on what's most most helpful to entrepreneurs. Right. Or because there's a level of you've done it before, you have empathy for it, or you realize the full scale of the complexity of what needs to happen. Yes. You know, you tend not to be in it for just a sheer financial return. Yes. But you do it because I think. Uh, great operators that have done it and hopefully had some level of uh, success, whether that be financial or whether that be spiritual, whatever you want to call it, yes. um, I think want to pay it forward, right? Somebody did that for them. Somebody wanted to help them or teach them. And so yes. part of my philosophy is finding places where my skill set can be additive, not dilutive. And yes. often investors can be dilutive. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and really honing in on, you know, are the skills that I bring, my network, Mavron, the firm's network, additive and can move the dial faster for somebody than someone else? Fabulous. Because capital's capital. And I know that many people speak about the problem of lack of mentorship for yes, women. absolutely. Um, would you have any comments or ideas about that, about how we yeah. can change that well, situation? Well, let me, let me back up and say yep. that I kind of, uh, I look at problems from a very interesting perspective, I think, yeah. which is I don't think they're just problems that emerge. I think they're symptoms of a number of different pieces of things in life that kind of converge, and then all of a sudden, poof, there's a problem. Okay. So, they, so the outcome of this problem could very well be that there's not enough mentors for women. But so let's trace back why that is. Yes. And I think it's some of the same reasons, honestly, why 
there's a lack of women getting funded or a, okay. a, a smaller number of women that are actually even looking to be funded, right? Okay. And a lot of it is because, you know, at least in venture, this very much for a long time was a cottage industry, right? Yes. It was an industry that if you just trace back the history, and by the way, I think it should go back to some of its roots versus where it is now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a history that was about sort of ex-operators kind of paying it forward and mentoring people to start businesses and putting their own capital to work. Interesting. And then, you know, as the business grew, it became more of an asset class that then had investors that were more professional investors and then it became more institutionalized, yes. so on and so forth, right? Yes. So if you think about who the pool of people to be funded would be, it was typically a pool of people that came from an embedded network. And if the majority right. of that network were men, right. especially in Silicon Valley in technology or engineering, right. right, which are, you know, I have a daughter, you know, and I'm focused every single day on making her do science projects and giving her robotics and, you know, transformers and Legos yes. because I'm convinced that this is a this is a culmination of a lot of things that tells little girls that become teenagers, that become women, yes. that they're not good in math and science, or they're yes. not good at engineering, or they're not good at technology. That isn't feasible. They have to go into nonprofit or HR or softer, squishier things, right? I agree. So when you trace all of that back, you know, um, I think movement in women in the workforce has been much more about either small companies being formed by women that aren't venture backed. Okay. Right? Or women going into large companies where large companies have recognized the dearth and has have tried in many cases to bring more women in. Mm -hmm. Now whether or not those women get to be in senior positions is a separate subject. But when it comes to venture backed companies, many of those come from an ecosystem that comes out of the valley or comes out of a place where I was in a startup. I was one or two in a company, I decided to leave to get my own startup, yes. or I had a financial liquidity event, so I want to go do it again, and most of the time that's men, right? right? So I think that some of it is not this embedded bias, right? Like I don't believe I that there's some cabal, you know, somewhere, you know, I don't believe that there is this secret group of men that are plotting to not have women be funded, right? Yes. I just don't basically believe that. I agree. I believe that, though, what I do believe is that the ecosystem isn't easy to break into. And I believe that the ecosystem doesn't have a organic on-ramp. And so okay. what that requires is a concerted effort to increase the on-ramp. Right. And so that is a very long-winded answer to a simple question you asked is yes. mentorship, right? Yes. yes. So I think that some of the issue is creating situations where women recognize that they have the goods. They have the ability to be great startup people. Yes. I think some of it is that in this generation, I believe there will be women that are now having liquidity events, which will start the flywheel going. Yes. Um, and I also believe that one of the things that we're starting to see online are much more opportunities for businesses that are by women for women because women do make 85% of the purchasing decisions in this country. Yes. Many of them are online a lot in yes. making those purchasing decisions. Yes. And so all of a sudden you get things like media, fashion, certain kinds of commerce businesses, businesses for women by women. And you also you start to see those really scaling. Yes. And so you start to say, well, geez, women understand those problems as well as anybody else. You get a couple of those that get successful, the flywheel starts, yes. and I think we have the opportunity but it's not just going to happen overnight. It's going to happen because dads and moms, you know, and schools um, kind of the culture. Yeah, they kind of understand that we like have the ability to be good, you know, mathematicians. And, yes. You know, it's it's not just wiring. You know, it's yes. it's the as I call it. You know, life is made up all the time of ability and willingness. Yes. And you know, I think there's organic ability. Yes. in the brains of women. Yes. I think the question is, do we construct the ability for them to engage and get success around the willingness? Very and, good. you know, I think that's the same thing about funding them. Yes, um, yes. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, something that I've heard over and over again is that women are often, uh, often lack confidence or um, they don't tend to push themselves as much as men, that sometimes the men come in and are quite brash and bold and the women often come in in much more, um, you know, holding back and uh, and not as confident or not um, 
talking as big as the guys. Um, do you think that this is a problem that's holding women back? And also, do you think that that's contributing to the mentoring problem where women don't feel they've got anything to offer to mentor or help other women? So I'm going to answer it in a couple of different ways. Okay? Great. So I'd say that my experience has not been that women that come in are not as... Well, I don't, I don't know if the word's brash. I do think women and men have different styles, yes. right? And I don't think one is more compelling than the other. Cool. I think it is a function of the fact that um, I, I think it's a different issue. Okay. I think the issue is not how they show up in the meeting, but do they even get the meeting? Oh, okay. And I think the issue is this, that women inherently aren't really raised, most of us, to believe that we have the right to just pick up the phone and use our network and call a whole bunch of people and just don't take no for an answer, right? Yep. We're not at, we're, we, don't, we don't kind of come out the world thinking, well, you know, of course they're going to see my me, right? right? It's, yeah. it's my right, right? Yeah. It's usually like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't want to impose, I don't want to, and that's, in some ways, when I even hear myself saying it, it's, it seems sort of kind of insulting or self-serving, yeah. but it's more about a place of um, a lack of sort of, if you will, ego that creates some way for you not to kind of stand out, right? Yeah. And so I think it starts some, somehow because it's very rare to get, I mean, to get a woman that becomes like tenacious enough to get any meeting that they want to get, right? Yes. So when women do, it's sort of like, oh, she was really special because she was a real firecracker. Right, uh -huh. and I've had situations where a woman comes in and does a pitch and just nails it, right? And you know, a guy could come in and nail it, and the comment when the guy leaves is not like "what a go getter," but when the woman leaves, it's like "what a firecracker, what a go getter." <laughs> now, I'm not sure that's good or bad, but what I'm saying is there's almost like a different expectation level yeah. that the room has, right? So I think I think that yeah. some of, and again, I don't think it's sexism or no. misogyny or any of those yeah. things which I think often people label these things yes. and then they become a self-fulfilling prophecy like if you look in the world for anything you could find it exactly. right I mean if you actually yeah. really look for anything yeah you know yeah. racism homophobia ageism yeah. you know uh, anything yeah you can find it there yeah. are examples yeah there are examples of sexist behaviors right but you either decide that that's not where you're gonna live your life or you decide you're going to live your life in at leveraging and making the positive change so that that isn't the baseline perception, Fabulous. right? Yeah. And so I think that, I'll, again, I, you've answered, a, asked me a simple question that I gave you a very, <laughs> there's a theme here, yeah. a complex answer, because I think these are complex issues. Yes, I agree. Um, And so I don't necessarily think that it's that women come in and they don't, they're, you know, they kind of underwhelm people. Hmm. I think it's a whole set of various elements that mm. contribute to people's reaction in the room, mm. whether the women are even getting the meeting or not, how yes. they're using their network, yes. right? I mean, just look at our profession. You know, the amount of investment deal flow that I get yes. on a weekly basis, and anybody, it's not just me, gets, yes. is, yes. you know, you have more options than you have opportunities to deploy time and capital, yes. right? So the truth of it is, you know, Stuff that really comes to your attention rises to the top of the level, and if somebody's not really like using their network or not really pushing, yes. in a certain way, they're going to not potentially get the same kind of attention. Not by you know design, but by you know byproduct. I agree. One entrepreneur mentioned to me that um, she felt that her receptivity was often um, misconstrued and. Um, in, in what way? Well, she said that often she would what, like to listen to people rather than continue to put her opinion out. <laughs> and, and obviously to integrate that and, and work out whether or not that was right. true or not. But um, she said often she felt that because of that, um, people felt she wasn't pushy enough or wasn't putting her own opinions out as much. And uh, that really rang a bell with me because I, I know a lot of women just naturally can be receptive. I mean, we're sort of made that way. Exactly. And, you know, we have to look after children and people that don't have all those communication skills. So we have to be able to yes. receive what's happening yes. with them. And I see that that can be a strength, obviously, but maybe 
in this culture and in this um, particular scenario where women are actually um, having to uh, go for funding or um, push their startup, maybe there is some uh, detrimental cultural perceptions yeah. about that. What, do, what would you think? I can see that, okay. right? I can see that, but I also think that um, this is why my really core belief in life around both entrepreneurs being funded and investors yeah. is that finding the right strategic alignment between what the entrepreneur wants and needs and what the investor can give and wants and needs. Yes. The, the, that marriage, that yes. partnership is not just, oh, I give you capital, right? It's So having said that, I think that um, really good investors know what right looks like for them. And they yeah. know what their skills can contribute. So for instance, you know, we tend to be a partnership that doesn't judge somebody on how they necessarily come in and just make the pitch. We try to get to know people over an elongated period of time. Because oh, you right. could find that somebody doesn't do well in a room, right? Yes. That doesn't mean they'll be a bad CEO yes, or a bad exactly. entrepreneur, exactly. right? I mean, yeah. you know, you can read the Steve Jobs book and see that there were some dynamics there that didn't necessarily transfer to human skills and the guy was, you know, unbelievable, yeah. right? Changed the world. Yeah. You know, we have, you know, example after example of example that not one type of personality makes for a fantastic leader or a CEO yes. or a person that can be successful yes. in a startup. Yes. So I think that the issue really is, you know, are you the kind of investor that's making a decision based on a partnership meeting where somebody's got an hour to impress you? Or right. are you the kind of investor that says, you know what, I really need to get to know you and I want you to get to know me. And I want to see over some period of time where there's the ability to marry what we can offer, earn the right to give you money, and see whether or not you have the you know sort of needs and wants that gives us what we need in terms of return. Mm -hmm. Then I think that that you know in the case of this company that we recently funded, we mm -hmm. got to know these women mm -hmm. over a period of time, yes. and uh, we wanted to really be sure. And it didn't have to do with the women or men that it was the right partnership. Wow, that's a great model and hopefully more venture capitalists might well, take that one up. I think it sounds yeah. um, like it would work better in the female community because obviously that's it's about, about relationships. building relationships and um, and then everyone's a lot more sure rather than racing yeah. into and, something and that also might work. that, you know, having been an operator myself, there is it's very rare that somebody comes in and gives me an investor presentation and it works out the way they said it would. Of course, right? Yeah. right? I mean, especially yeah. early stage, right? I mean, yeah. the whole point is that you are investing in something that's a concept that has, that you're, you're investing in a market that's big enough, presumably, a product that has, resonates with you. Yes. But you're really investing around the people. Yes. Right? And so what I say to people all the time, like, most people wouldn't really get married after a one hour meeting. They might. And in, who knows where, it might work better. Um, but uh, all I'm getting at is that yes. I think that's just very much our philosophy. There's some firms that are exactly like that. And yes, some, I agree. Yeah, so I think yeah. it's just, so I think for women that's a good advantage. It um, certainly aligns with um, a philosophy I've had. I've been helping entrepreneurs pitch and my piece is to try and engage the investor exactly. rather than just to hammer them with information. And I think, again, that's just the seed of what you're saying about, is about creating some sort of relationship and rapport rather than just Absolutely. spewing forth a, a pitch. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely delightful to Great. talk to you today, Amy. It's been fabulous and um, I wish you all the best with the firm. Thanks. Well, I think you're doing a great thing here, so thanks for taking this topic and spreading the message. Thank you. Here. Yeah.